earlier. When we talk about the academic performers, where we're held accountable as a school is what's called the MCAs. All right? And there's another assessment that we take at Eagle Ridge Academy is the ACTs. Now, as we go forward at Eagle Ridge Academy, you're going to see us align our assessments a lot more with the ACTs um, than, than we do with the MCAs. And that's going to be about a two year, it's going to take us about two years to get into that. Um, ACTs are much higher expectations, higher rigor, and we think that our curriculum aligns better with that. Uh, and as you see, we'll look at the MCAs, and we really did well on them. So we need a little bit different measurement. All right? So we'll go ahead and get started. Something we'll look at tonight is we're going to take what I call a data walk. I love looking at data and data. I, I just love it. We're going to look at the overall proficiency. All right? When I say proficiency, that is the percentage of students that have passed the MCA test. All right? We're going to look at subcategories and demographics. No Child Left Behind, the federal government, and then MDE holds us accountable, not for overall proficiency anymore, but for actually each subcategory. They break subcategories, MDE breaks the subcategories, there's eight what they call subcategories. So I don't define this, MDE does. One is white, and that's the, that's the term. Black, which includes any students that have um, Black skin, brown skin, so Somalian, African American, East African, um, Asian, uh, which would Asian, East Indian, that, that would be included in there. Um, students receiving educational benefits for a free and reduced lunch. Students on an IEP spe receiving special education. Okay, so we're we're gonna I mean we're gonna look at those subcategories because one thing with overall proficiency. It doesn't tell the whole story. You can have a school that has 90% overall proficiency, but who do they have in their school? So we're going to compare what I call apples to apples. All right? And then we're going to show you growth. Because what if we're getting students that are already proficient? Are they growing? Are, what if we get students that, are, that aren't proficient? Are we helping them become proficient? So we want to look at all those factors. Whenever we look at data, Look at the whole picture. The Star Trip, the Pioneer Press, they never give you the whole picture. All right? Okay. So we're going to go big picture, and then we're going to narrow it down. So let's talk. We're going to talk. There's three types of tests that the uh, state gives for the MCAs. Reading, math, and science. We're only held accountable for reading and math. However, I think it's very important as a former, former science teacher <laughs> that we really look at our science numbers also. All right? So this was a new year, or this year, 2012, 2013, was a new test. All right? The whole state decreased in scores. So if we look at the state average, state average in 2009, 70, 70, 75, 76, boom, 58. Look at all these other districts. You saw a dramatic decrease in all those districts. Why? Brand new test. All right? Schools were not ready for them. Um, the, the test had higher rigor. So here's what I look at. I got, back in July, I, realized, I found out we were at 79%. My first thought was, what? We went down 11 points. I'm stressed but I don't know what else everyone else did. So this is how I compare to see how we, we reacted to this. The state went down 18, Edina went down 12, 15. We went down 11. So, yes, we went down 11 points, but in comparison to your Minnetonkas, your Edinas, all those other schools, we, we did well. We didn't go down as much. However, one, of a, one out of five of our students are not preferred are not proficient in, in reading. And so we need to work on that. But we're, but we're going to dig more into that. Now realize Edina, number one test score in the state for reading. Eagle Ridge Academy, number four. But, Can I ask you a question yes. about that? Do you think that's because, because I, I, I saw this online, I saw yeah. you had this in the retreat and stuff. Yep. And I'm just wondering is, have we not been able to catch Edina in reading, even though we are a very strong reading school, is that because they're more homogeneous in their population? You'll see. Okay. You'll, yes. Don't give my answer away. Okay, I like sorry. to build it up. 
<laughs> yes, and we need to ask questions. What are they doing that we're not doing? If, and so we need to ask those questions. Okay. All right? So hold, keep some of these questions because we're going to really go into this. And I want you to ask me tough questions and challenge me because this is how we grow. Let's look at math. Please. All right? So Eagle Ridge Academy, now we've had the same test basically since back here. All right? So that's different. 73%, and we're now at 88%. And you can see the other schools. Um, Ian Prairie's kind of stayed the same. Edina has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, the state has stayed the same, went up a little bit. Eagle Ridge Academy has went up 15 points since 2009. Eagle Ridge Academy, as a K-12 school district, has the highest math scores in the state. These, uh, that's amazing. These students, you know, your children work so hard. I mean, when people ask, why are your test scores so hard? Hi. Because our kids work harder than any other kids out there. That's the facts of it. Can I just say something real quick? Yeah. My son, when I told him, I said, this is why you work so hard. He's like, we're famous as a school. He was so Aww. excited because they showed him this. He's like, we're famous. You know, but it was yeah. great. You know, it does pay off. It's rewarding, you know. So. It is. They work so hard. I do. And i got to tell you what else. I think they've worked hard for a long time, too. It hasn't just been last year or the year before. But we've been more strategic about the work that they're doing in math. We use the data-driven instructions, the GDI, where we assess three times a year where are they struggling, and we focus on that and we teach that. Um, we've also, last year we started the Targeted Services Program as a pilot, and this year full, imp full implementation of that. So... Um, so when I look at this, I want to make sure, one, that we continue growing. Um, another thing is, I want to be higher than Ian Perry and Edina. So, <laughs> let's look at science a little bit. Look at those science, look at the science growth from last year to this year. Last year we were at 69%, so we had 64, 71, Went up to 79% last year, 10 points. And so that is number two or three in the state, depending on how you look at it. It's number two or three in the state. So between math number one, reading number four, science number two or three, the state does what's called, and many organizations do what's called the composite score. They add the scores together. We have the number one composite scores in the state. So these kids need to be, they've, they've done an outstanding job with that. I was very impressed with our science scores. We think the reason um, they, went, they went up so much is the teachers used Study Island um, a lot more as, as, a study, as a study guide. Here's the issue with science. Science is given in fifth grade, eighth grade, and then the year the student has biology, generally 10th or 11th grade, okay? So here's the problem. Math and reading you basically give almost every year. So it's a little chunk of material. When a student takes it at fifth grade and then eighth grade, that's three years of material we're asking that student to remember. And so what we do is that eighth grade year, we teach some of the eighth grade material, and then a lot of it's review and sinking in. And, and they're actually doing a lot of practice on that study out. So we need a balance of new material versus teaching to the test. I mean, we don't want to do that too much. Yet, they're not remembering all the things they learned in fifth or, or sixth or seventh grade. So that's a little difference between, so that's the big difference we did for last year. Now, this is what you're going to hear from, from some critics. Well, yeah, you have these scores because you have the more affluent students, um, you know, you don't have at-risk populations. And a lot, of, a lot of schools, that's correct. So I want to tell you, our demographics are the same within 2 or 3% of, of uh, Eden Prairie. We're at 16% free and reduced lunch this year. They're at 19%. Um, so, and when we look at Edina, they're in the single digits. Minnetonka are in the single digits, 6%. six percent. So what I like to do is I like to step back and compare apples to apples. We look at our students who are receiving free and reduced lunch and compare that to other students in similar situations. And that's when you get a true look, all right? So, 
receiving educational benefits. They used to be called free and reduced lunch. So now they've changed the term receiving educational benefits. So what, let me orientate you a little bit to the slide. It's a little confusing. See that line going across and where it says state all? That is the average Minnesota student. Takes all the students and combines them into one. My goal is that our at-risk students score higher than the average state student. Does that, does that make sense? So this is students that only that receive educational benefits free and reduced. Compared to Eagle Ridge Academy, or us, EP, Edina, and I want to throw Minnetonka up there because they're a high performing school district and I want to, I want to look at what they're doing. And then, I, then we, this word says just state, that's students who receive educational benefits, the state average. All right. Does everyone understand the comparisons up here? So there's only children that are receiving. Yes. Okay. Is the state, and where it says state all, that's the combination. Yeah. Okay? And the scores for the other schools, including us, that's percentage? For free and reduced. Still. Yes. That only is that. So look at this right here. So Eagle Ridge Academy is scoring in math about at least 20 points higher than other students in other schools in similar situations. And we beat the goal that I want our average students scoring higher than the average state student. Um, look at reading. Same thing. Science. Look at Minnetonka. Minnetonka did very well in their science test. Okay, I want to find out what they're doing. Well, you see that across. Um, so when we talk about, have you heard of the achievement gap, right? That's what we're talking about, is how are students who don't receive free and reduced compared to students getting free and reduced? We want to try to close that gap. Our gap at Eagle Ridge Academy is about is between 8 and 10 points. The average gap is about 30 points. Well, there's about 30 points. Okay? Uh, black students. The math, 74% of our black students pass the math test, reading, and science. And so look at, look at the state here. That's a little scary. Yeah, I mean, and even even our best districts are at best 50%. So it's a, well, I'm glad we're higher than a lot of schools. I'm not, sad, I'm really not satisfied with our results. And quite frankly, when I look at other schools in the state, that's a little scary. All right? A little scary. Yes? When you're doing this black students, how do you know where do you put that's a great question. Um, when, you, when you join Eagle Ridge Academy, parents choose right, what category they go with. So that's, that's how that works. There's actually a, 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 a form that they choose. There's demographics, race. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. The state automatically puts them in, if, if a combination of black and white would automatically put them in black. Automatic. That's a great question. Yeah. So we put it all on the infinite campus. Then the state, then that transfers to something called Mars, and Mars will automatically switch it to that. Good question. Students receiving special ed services. All right. So in math and in reading, we're higher than the comparison districts. We're higher than, we're not meeting the goal in reading for higher than state all, okay? So that's an opportunity for growth right there. And quite frankly, our students receiving special ed services, four out of 10, two out of five aren't proficient. So that's something we need to work on. Something we need to work on. And when you go to your student services, you'll learn a little bit more about special ed. Okay, then white students. Okay. 
Asian. Our highest Asian population is uh, East Indian. Uh, students from uh, families from East India. And we are right now 20% uh, Asian population. Um, about 10% in the upper school and about 30% in the lower school. So in five years from now, our population is going to look much different. Our demographics going to look much different. All right. Demographics for Asian and black women. Say that again. I don't know. I have no clue. I have no clue. I could find out. I could find out. I don't know. I wonder that. I wonder that. Yeah, I don't know. But I'm going to find that out. All right. So, you know, yeah, so for Eagle Ridge County, 97% of our Asian students passed the math test, uh, reading, and, and in science. So. Does Minnesota, um, being from California, we always say they segregated our LEP kids or limited language? They do. do, they do this here? is a, another great question. As you know, Eagle Ridge Academy really didn't have a program before. Uh -huh. So we never identified students as LEP prior to this school year. So there's no data. Because I'm guessing that reading, that could be a fair number of those kids just yeah. from being in the school and talking to them. Yeah. So this them. year, 1314 will be the first year that we'll be able to pull up that other subcategory. Okay. Great question. So in years past, we haven't identified students, uh, uh, English language learner students. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Because that would be a whole separate category then, right? They would be yeah. separate. Even if they are Asian, they're no longer going to be categorized. counted in that category, they would be counted in... Another good question. You can be counted in multiple categories. Oh, you can. Yep. So you can be, you can be white, special education, receiving free and reduced benefits, mm -hmm. and ELL. So you could be like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can. Yeah. And so you count in four categories. Okay. Okay. What some large school districts are doing, because they have so many kids, a lot more data, they're actually saying, okay, what's our percent proficient for African American students who are receiving special education services who are boys, okay, because there's research out there. And so they're able to do that. If we were to extract our data, data like that, there's only like one or two or three kids that would fall in category, so it'd be difficult to do. Great questions. All right. So what we've talked about is overall proficiency. Four or five years ago, that's what every school was judged on. What's your overall proficiency? But we can see, because of demographics, that taints a school. It doesn't show the true picture. You could have a school that has 70% proficiency, yet they have all at-risk students. And they're outperforming other school districts in each subcategory. You could have the opposite. You could have a, a school getting 90% um, on their overall proficiency, however, because their at-risk populations are all very low, you know, so. All right, there's something else that schools are judged on, or held accountable, it's called growth, all right? Growth is very difficult to define, so I'm gonna to try to keep it simple, but there's what's called an, an expected growth, meaning if I'm in third grade, and if I'm at a medium level, an average level, and when I go in fourth grade, I should still score about the same level. That's an expected growth. So I grew one grade level. If I grow more than a grade level, that's high growth. If I grow, if I, if I grow um, the expected growth, that's medium growth. If I grow a little bit less than grade level, that's low growth. They still grew, but it's low growth. So, this is for math. We had the highest in the state out of these two categories is where we want to be. We had the highest in the state for math um, in our growth. That, you see that little bell-shaped curve there? That's how this, most schools look, all right? But we have, you know, that's, we have a straight linear going straight up, all right? Edina did very well, too. Edina did very well. I got some good growth. However, I know that Edina hired math specialists last year at each 
elementary school site. Did you know this? I did not. And my girlfriend is, and she's now hired full time this year. Yeah. Um, in the middle of last year, they panicked about their MCA scores. And about this time last year, they got their scores from the previous year. Yeah. And they panicked. So um, in January, they hired a full, well, a half time specialist for third through fifth grade at each elementary school to work with their at risk students. Um, and then at the end of this year, they uh, got, or at the end of last year, they got grant money for the next two years to make those positions full time, working K through five at each elementary wow. school. Mm -hmm. wow. So their growth this year was bigger than the previous year, but mm -hmm. that's because they added a lot of supports. Yeah. And, and the larger the school district, the, the more difficult it is to make a shift. Eagle Ridge Academy, if something doesn't work here, we can change it tomorrow. That's what's great. We don't have a lot of bureaucracy, and there's not a lot of hoops to jump through. So that's what's nice. Let's look at reading. Now, reading, we did. We were higher than the state. We did fine. Our opportunities for growth at Eagle Ridge Academy is we have to hit this reading head on. Okay, one out of one out of five of our students are not proficient. We had above average growth, but it's not high enough growth. So that, when we talk about setting goals for our school and our teachers and our students this year, it's in reading. It's in reading. We're going to talk a little bit about what we've done in reading and realize we saw this last year. We knew this was coming. We knew this was coming. And, um, but my philosophy is when I came here last year, I noticed in the first two months, but I didn't want to just scrap what we were doing, make a rash decision, and implement a curriculum and instructional philosophy that didn't give the teachers time to soak it in and let it stick. If we force something on them, it won't stick. And we'll end up dumping it because it didn't work and getting something new. So we took our time. We took our time to implement something that is now implemented this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. All right, this is, a, this is pretty exciting. ACT scores. We have the second highest ATC, ACT scores in the state. And out of, out of public schools, because I don't have I don't have privileged in, in, um, information for private schools. Out of public schools, second highest in the state. I put Math and Science Academy up there because they beat us. And I met with their director on Monday, and I said, "Why did you beat us?" I said, "It was great. We had a great conversation." Um, and because he said, "Well, boy, I'm a math school. It's in my title. Why'd you beat us in math?" You know, so it was good conversations. Um, is that a K-12 zone? It's a, no. Yeah. It's a 5th through 12th grade. 5th through 12th grade. And a little bit about Math and Science Academy, they're right next to 3M in Woodbury there, and that's where they get a lot of their families from, hence Math and Science Academy. So they re actually recruit there. Um, well, they have a genetic um, disposition. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat school, though. So that's we were at 24.7 last year, and since Eagle Academy started, they we have been from a 23.9 to to a 25.2 prior to this year. And those are those are good, strong composite scores. I need to be clear with you. This year we will go down, and the reason I'm saying that is last the last few years we have tested between or between 70 and 80% of our students have taken the test. And the kids that usually sign up, volunteer to take the test, are your higher achieving students. This year, because we believe in this so much, is we are paying for every student to take the test. So 100% of our kids are going to take the test. When that happens, your overall ACT average goes down. And that's okay, because I'm not in it. We're not in it to have the highest. We're in it for every student to achieve high as, they, as high as they can. So I, I want to be open with you about that. All right? Uh, now, Minnesota had the highest ACT average in the nation for the eighth year in a row. So, yeah, that's pretty exciting. Opportunities for growth. We talked a little bit about the reading. That's where we need to see the growth. I'm a strong believer that we could have a quick fix out there tomorrow. The reading test is in third through eighth grade and tenth. We could go out there, I could sit down with those teachers and say, this is what you need to fix. But how you fix something is getting to the kindergartners, first graders, and second graders. If you have a strong program there, you build the skills. However, we may not see the results for 
three, four, five, six years. Doesn't mean we let the third through eighth graders just go aside. But we've stuck a lot of resources in there, a lot of training, new assessments. Um, what we're using now is a step assessment. And traditional reading assessments have test fluency, decoding skills, and what we call um, literal comprehension, meaning you ask me a question, I can restate it. What the step assessment does, it also checks for inferential um, comprehension in oral language, meaning the students are able to infer what happens next, able to predict. It's a whole other level. It places them in um, a guided reading, and all our teachers were retrained in guided reading this year, so K through three. Um, so that, that's the big piece. That's the big piece there. All right. What are your What are your questions for me? We have yeah, we have little, we have some time here. About five minutes. What are your, what are your questions for me or comments? Yeah. Okay. What guided reading is? There's three or four important parts of a literacy block. Okay. There's read alouds where I, as a teacher, read a text higher level than the students can read because it introduces them to higher language skills. Then there's phonics where it teaches them to decode and actually add, you know, there's guided reading, which means if the students read a book at their level, they sit down in groups of three to eight with the teacher, and then the teacher asks them questions about the text and ties the text to real life ties the text to what's the moral of the story. Um, for example, um, second grade was doing Charlotte's Web about two weeks ago. And a question was, what's the rat's name? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> right? Is that your I don't know. Uh, Templeton. Templeton. Okay. Thank good you. Line. Good job. <laughs> Templeton, right? If you remember Templeton, Templeton's is crabby, but he's good-hearted, but crabby guy. And so the teacher would ask, do you know a Templeton? Do you have a friend like Templeton? Do you have an uncle like Templeton? And they had discussion about the text, getting into the text. What I like about that is we're able to tie that to the pillars. We're able to use a text and tie it to the pillars um, and a lot of inferential comprehension. What students are used to is what's called basal readers. You know, Tom and John went down to the very boring, the kids hate to read those. So these are real texts that have a story and a myth behind them. So, did that answer your question? Yeah, great. Other questions? Is that um, integrated with what you were saying about step assessment? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I don't know what it stands for. Uh, ask Miss Bear. It's like strategic testing, evaluation, something. Yeah, there you go. Progress. I don't know. It's something like that. So it's uh, it was developed by the University of Chicago probably about seven or eight years ago. Not a lot of great educational things have come out. I haven't seen a lot that came out of the University of Chicago, but this assessment is one that re it's, it's really good. Um, it's some of your 90-90-90 um, schools use it, uh, and those are your top schools in the nation. What a 90-90-90 school is, the students that have like 90% African American students, they're 90% in poverty and 90% proficient in the state test. And those are the, those are the strategies we want to we want to find out. And so what Uncommon Schools is one of them, and they're from New Jersey, and we actually went out there and were trained on this assessment this summer. Pretty cool. Yeah? Um, what, what is your perspective and how, as a school, are we looking at the kids? Are we looking to move more kids from the meet standards to the exceed standards? Because in education over the last 10 to 15 years, that perspective has been lost. And we used to have many schools where the kids, a large percentage, exceeded standards. And with No Child Left Behind, they forgot about those kids. And so a lot of those kids have slid back into the meet standards. So how as a school are we going to 
keep those kids who exceed standards where they are and try to move more kids into that category? Um, so, one, we need to start tracking that data. So next year, uh, if we're meeting, if we're scoring like this, we should now stop talking about, yeah, 90% proficient, but how many of our students are at the exceed standards? Mm -hmm. That's the next question. Um, one way you can look at it is that high growth. Those are generally kids that went from the M to the E. But what, we can, what we're doing right now in math is what we level in math. So kids are getting their level in math. The, the low group at Eagle Ridge Academy is at or above grade level in math. I, I mean, and so our high groups are a grade level or grade and a half or two levels. So that's how we're going to get those kids from here to here. And now, same with the reading, with the guided reading books. Putting them in those levels and constantly challenging them. So no longer do you have the student that already knows how to read this book. In fact, has read this book five or six times. But now they have to sit there again. And they're going to stay right here. So now we're taking them and testing them with the step assessment three times a year and putting them in their groups that are better tailored to their individual needs. That's how you do it um, for math and reading. For science, right now I don't have, we don't have that figured out, how to go from an M to an E. It's going to take about a year or two to really figure that out. And schools haven't done that because they haven't been held accountable for science. So they're not reacting to it yet. I just I see in the lower school particularly I see um, a great growth opportunity mm -hmm. for enriching the curriculum for the higher level kids mm -hmm. because there's some areas in the curriculum that just seem a little bare bones. The, the, so your original question though said how are we going to get kids from go to M to E? So no, what no, did no. the enriching M's? The, the well, I guess the, the kids who already meet, they, they walk in your door meeting students. Yes. Okay. Like, those kids need to be enriched because, right. like, I have two of those kids. They yeah. walked in your door, you don't have to worry about them. But they need, so they already knew most of the curriculum that was being right. presented at their grade levels. So I, that's where I see the enrichment. You want to make sure, because that's where kids are, you know, we're in schools today, schools are focused on the ones who are not. Right. And so, like, one whole group tonight is about targeted services. I mean, I don't hear anything in there about gifted because we don't have gifted here because we're rigorous and we're rigorous in some areas but not in all. And so that's where, like, in the science curriculum in the lower school, I would say particularly that is the case. Okay. And I'm just saying that's an area for growth. Yeah. I think that we could look at that and say, how could we make that more challenging? For those kids who already walk in, say in fifth grade, and who could step in the first day of fifth grade and take that science MCA and meet the standards, no problem. Yeah, so. that's a good point. And you're right. That's tonight we're talking about student services for students who are struggling. Yeah. So what services are there for students that they're already where they're supposed to be? How do we bring them to the next level? Because I think parents, me in particular, and a lot of other parents, we came here because we weren't getting it in public school. Which it's 10,000 times better here. Right. <laughs> There's no opportunities for growth. There's always that. Okay, right now, I think it is time to, I think it's that time to start.